welcome, welcome back uh, after the break. And uh, I hope you had an opportunity to watch the powerful video from CHS Alliance Lutheran World Federation, which allows us to hear directly from the children themselves living in a refugee settlement in Uganda on the issue of violence and measures that can be taken to keep them safe from harm. And I would like to remind you that you can pop up your comments on the comments in the stage chat. And, and uh, to continue, this morning we heard from representative of the disability, HIV, LGBTQ communities about how nothing without us, nothing about us without us is more than a slogan. We heard that involving people affected by a crisis ensures better care better dignity and a dramatic improve, improvement in results. The panel included a human rights advocate and reflected upon what a rights-based approach could mean for humanitarians. Now we are about to hear more about what talking about taking, taking a people-centered approach means when we are dealing with preventing and responding to sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. What are the implications for the humanitarian and development organizations, particularly during COVID-19, when domestic violence against women and children increased and, and the pandemic exacerbated vulnerabilities, power imbalances and structural inequalities that affect victims? So a warm welcome to Jane Connors, who will tell us more about her role as the United Nations Victims Rights Advocate and why we need to do more to put the rights and, and dignity of victims and survivors at the forefront of our efforts to prevent and respond to sexual exploitation and abuse. Okay. Um, it's a privilege for me today uh, to address uh, the CHS Alliance Exchange, uh, the 2021 uh, meeting. Um, and I'm really, uh, really very pleased to be here and I congratulate the Alliance for all the work to put this uh, conference together. I know I'm speaking to a very large audience across countries and time zones and I'm hopeful that despite the challenges of COVID-19, you, your families and friends are safe, well and cheerful. I've been asked to reflect on what is needed to promote a victim survivor's approach to our work in the humanitarian sector, where I see progress and where I see remaining hurdles. I'm going to start by recalling that in 2017, the United Nations Secretary General launched a new approach to sexual exploitation and abuse by our personnel. This has four elements, placing the rights and dignity of victims at the centre of prevention and response, ending impunity, engaging all stakeholders in our efforts, and being transparent in our communications to build a worldwide knowledge base on sexual exploitation and abuse. The focus on victims' rights and the complex and lasting impact of these wrongs on them, their families and communities, as well as their trust in our organizations is the principal element of the strategy and cuts across the others. It is a significant, and from my point of view, brave shift from earlier approaches. These prioritize the reputation of the UN's large family of organizations and the conduct and discipline of our personnel. To realize this shift, the Secretary General created the Victims' Rights Advocate Post and requested that field victims' rights advocates be designated in the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Haiti and South Sudan. He encouraged nomination of advocates in other settings, underlining the fact that sexual exploitation and abuse are system-wide concerns. They occur in peace, humanitarian and development programs. In all of these contexts, power imbalance between these personnel and the people we have pledged to serve, their situation of extreme vulnerability and the broader context of inequality and discrimination drive these wrongs. Accordingly, we support victim survivors of uniformed, civilian, international and national personnel, as well as victim survivors of implementing partners. The Field Victims Advocates and I began work in September 2017. And since that time, I've sought to integrate a victim survivor's rights approach to prevention and response across all our organizations. I advocate with member states, UN partners, all sectors of civil society and the media, 
to give visibility to victims and making clear that at the core of these wrongs is not our reputation, but a woman, girl, man or boy who is hurt, fearful, often subject to reprisals, intersectional discrimination and stigma. They may be excluded by their families and communities and perhaps left with a child resulting from the misconduct. I urge that our interventions are conceptualized, designed and implemented as rights-based and empowering. And here language is important. I speak of rights, not assistance, not help. I underline that each victim survivor is different and their needs are diverse. Generalization is unhelpful responses must be tailored. Until the pandemic grounded me, I visited countries with varying UN footprints to see how the Secretary General's policy was being implemented. I met victims on their own terms so I could hear from them directly and assure them they were not forgotten. Their concerns differed according to country and context, but they were very similar. They described inaccessible, unclear or complex complaint mechanisms lack of protection, limited medical, psychological and livelihood support, distressing investigative procedures, often with repeated interviews, little or no support for legal or other address, particularly on paternity child maintenance claims and patchy information on the progress of their complaints, including whether the abuser had been held accountable in some way. The field advocates receive similar feedback. They hear that victim survivors do not have documentation or laboratory results essential for accountability processes. They cannot open bank accounts to receive remittances from fathers of their children because they do not have the required minimum deposit. Or they lack, lack access to skills training and livelihood support so they can rebuild their lives. These advocates are the first point of call for victim survivors. They coordinate their right to support and assistance and accompany, accompany them through accountability processes. These include UN administrative and disciplinary proceedings and national criminal and civil cases, such as paternity child maintenance claims. Importantly, they keep them updated throughout. The advocates, especially during COVID-19, have had significant impact. This is where I see real progress. They demonstrate that a person on the ground dedicated to prioritizing victim survivors' rights, someone they trust and to whom they can turn for assistance, confident they will advocate on their behalf, makes a real difference. Let me give you just three examples. At the height of implementation of COVID-19 mitigation measures on the ground, UN staff were working remotely and face-to-face -face interaction was impossible. Nonetheless, these advocates arranged urgent medical care, including for childbirth and psychosocial support for victims through trusted implementing partners. They kept track of victim survivors and they, the support they received through calls and texts, even as they moved across countries and borders, reassuring them that their needs would be met. In January this year, the advocate in the Democratic Republic of the Congo was embedded in the OIOS investigations into cases relating to the Ebola response, not to investigate, but to provide victims with emotional and practical support and follow up information. This has been replicated in other settings and in national investigations. In Haiti, the advocate is spearheading action to resolve 38 pending paternity child maintenance claims relating to former minister personnel. She mobilizes pro bono lawyers in countries of jurisdiction. These are complex transnational cases and she is contacted by the mothers at least once a day. Through resources provided by the Trust Fund in support of victims of sexual exploitation and abuse, she organizes livelihood skills upgrading support for the mothers, arranges payment of the children's school and associated fees and school lunches. This means the children have at least one meal a day. These actions restore the dignity of victim survivors and go some way to holding us to account. They also restore trust in our organizations. Accordingly, I champion the designation of field advocates wherever they are needed. Or if that is not possible, 
a middle ground, the appointment of a focal point to advocate for victims' survivors' rights. I am delighted that UN Nepal, working in a development context, is the first to implement this. And I look forward to expansion of the network of advocates across our peace, humanitarian and development action as a key part of the creation of an enabling environment to encourage victim survivors to come forward. I also encourage Alliance members and others who work with victim survivors to consider appointing an advocate at headquarters locations and on the ground. Now, we've seen undeniable progress in the institutionalization of a victim-centered and rights-based approach across UN organizations. And I could give you some examples about, of policy and practical measures that brought, uh, brought us, have brought us forward. And I think the most important are the, is the practical support for victims, which has been stepped up through the multifaceted uh, projects which uh, are funded by the Trust Fund. But we've got much more to do including on improving understanding of the content of a victim's survivor's rights approach. These cases are complex and often require balancing the rights of the victim to safety against the UN's desire to protect others from the conduct through securing accountability of the perpetrator. And for me, this is the hurdle. What is the approach? Many of you might know that I've been crafting a victim's rights statement. Uh, I was inspired by the national level victim's rights codes, charters or principles applicable to victims of crime. There are federal and state codes in the US, a new victim's rights code in the UK, while the Un European Union's 2012 victim's rights directive is reflected in most member states' legal frameworks. We in the UN uh, have many documents which set out victim's rights, in particular in the nine core human rights treaties. Building on these documents and advice from experts working with victim survivors of national and international crimes, trafficking, terrorism, child sex tourism, sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment, and consultations with UN colleagues, I've set out four guiding principles. Prioritization of victim survivors' rights, needs, safety and dignity. The right not to be judged, blamed or held responsible for the harm that assistance to promote well-being and recovery and moving forward will be offered, and the right to non-discrimination on any ground. I also describe 10 rights, to be treated with respect, to receive assistance and res support, to justice and accountability, deci to decide how involved to be, to get information, to be heard, to privacy and confidentiality, to be protected, to a remedy, and the right to complain. Managing expectations has been a major challenge in agreeing the statement. The UN has limited capacity to realize these rights, as this often depends on state action. At the same time, such as in the case of the field advocates, it does more than it thinks. In any event, a right can exist without being immediately realizable. We see from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that spelling out a right and its content is empowering for victim survivors. The statement is aspirational, directed to building the confidence of victim survivors and underlining the responsibility of UN staff and their implementing partners. Ironically, uh, this year I led development of a set of principles on a victim-centered approach to sexual harassment. It reflects the content of the statement and interestingly it was endorsed by the High Level Committee on Management in July. In fact, when we treated, uh, tweeted the principles, they were retweeted 24,000 times, testifies to the importance of documents such as these. My office also, with two other entities in the UN, is developing a multimedia training package on the meaning of the victim survivor's rights and centred approach to sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment, which should be uh, uh, available next year. Implementation of the rights I describe is uh, crucial for victim survivors. We also must be alive to the drivers of exploitation and abuse and anticipate their occurrence, thereby creating an enabling environment where they will come forward rather than burdening them with the responsibility of generating action.
Victim survivors also report to those they trust and may not feel comfortable with the complaint boxes or electronic or similar systems. They don't spend time determining the affiliation of the perpetrator. So don't differentiate among UN entities, non-governmental actors and others when they complain. We need a joined up approach and a way to exchange information directed towards a common purpose so we have action. We must hear what our beneficiaries need as well as the opinions of victim survivors on how we are doing so our policies and actions are relevant. And finally, states must step up in accountability processes and the resolution of paternity claims. Some are, for example, by organising courts martial for their personnel in countries where abuse has occurred or strengthening their procedures on paternity child maintenance claims, including on DNA testing. Others have modified their legislation to create or expand the scope of extraterritorial jurisdiction. This is encouraging and should be replicated and adapted. And of course, these developments need to be widely known and indeed used for the benefit of victim survivors. Many thanks. Sir. Have a great conference. Thank, thank you, Jane. Uh, I would like to invite the audience to post their, their questions on the chat. Uh, and uh, while we wait for the questions to come up and reflections, Jane, a, a question, are you hopeful about what is uh, happening in terms of the, the victims and survivor rights approach? Yes, I'm hopeful. I think we've seen, um, maybe it's because people talk to me, um, but whenever they talk to me, yes, they say uh, we take the victim's rights approach. And that's why I, I think it's absolutely necessary that we spell out, uh, and I spell, probably spelled it out in too much detail, we spell out what it means, that we, fo we focus on uh, rather than looking at what, what we're doing in a charitable way, which is often the framework, you know, we're doing so much for people, et cetera, et cetera. We have to remember uh, uh, that those people are victims, survivors of uh, the wrongdoing of our personnel. Uh, we have a responsibility to step up and it is their right. It is their right um, to uh, have, have repair in their lives, uh, to have support and assistance. It is their right to have accountability and accountability comes in many ways. But I think the work of uh, the people I spoke to, uh, spoke of on the ground shows that, that actually having someone, someone who is there saying, I'm championing your rights, makes such a difference. Uh, and that's why I'm really pushing, um, thinking about doing that and, and not having, you know, we have people on the ground, but, but have someone who's absolutely there to uh, support um, uh, the implementation of the rights of the survivor victim. Thank you. Uh, another question, how, how has COVID affected the, um, the situation on the ground? Well, um, COVID, in, in when at the high point of COVID, uh, we were all locked down and that included uh, staff members on the ground and they could not meet face to face uh, with victim survivors. Uh, and victim survivors like to meet face to face. Uh, they, mm -hmm. they, that's what they like to do. Uh, complaint boxes, things of that nature. Most of them have not got uh, access to the internet. They have, they don't, they have little phones, but not smartphones. So, so, so they really like to see a person. So, and and also we had various um, projects or various activities that we had established for victim survivors where they could engage in in um, in in capacity building projects, in livelihood support. Uh, and they had to be shut down because they did things together. So you, when you're in a tailoring, a tailoring situation, you're all together making clothes. When you're doing maize flour production, you're there together. So they had to see. So that had some impact. But as I said, um, uh, the, uh, the advocates did as much as they could. Uh, and uh, they did indeed organise um, medical care, psychosocial support and several children, many children, well, not many, but uh, uh, at least five children that I know of 
were born as a result of sexual exploitation and abuse, and they organised um, uh, their care. But I think it will take us some time. Uh, we look, it looks as though the cases have gone down, but it will take us some time to assess and see exactly what went on. And we can see this from the um, from the allegations that are arose in the context of the Ebola response. It takes time. Often um, complaints come much later, many years later often, as people gain confidence and realise that there is a point uh, for them to bring these uh, cases forward. Mm, thank you. So the, the pace at which we introduce these measures and also the pace at which change happens was mentioned in the morning in the, in the discussions about we need to adjust to the pace of the community. Mm -hmm. So we have our strategies, but if we follow our strategies, sometimes we are going too fast for the communities. Are you having a similar experience? Uh, I think we're probably going too slow for the communities. Uh, we, we're uh, we're discussing uh, something where we should be a little bit faster. Uh, mm. But we do, I mean, there's a lot of engagement with the communities. This isn't something which is, I mean, this is an idea of the Secretary-General to put the right, it's an obvious idea really, rights of victims front and centre. Um, but prior that hadn't been the way things had been thought of um, but uh, we do engage very closely with the communities um, they uh, also are engaged in um, in developing uh, developing the programs with us um, the uh, the people who um, the women men who may have been victim survivors of uh, sexual exploitation or abuse or are at, at risk um, children and so on, they talk about what they want to do, what sorts of programs they would like to be involved in. Uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example, uh, children are involved in, in planting gardens, uh, because uh, so they go there after school to deal with gardens, things of this nature, which sounds a little bit no, naive in some ways, but it, they're interested in doing that, and then they are not around. They're, they are they are in a context of protection, uh, and this is extremely important. Um, and we do, I mean, prevention. Um, I look at. It sounds as though I look at the end rather than the outset, but um, having a victim's rights survivors' rights approach also uh, is protective uh, as people become aware of the fact that they have uh, the right to complain, the right to seek assistance and the right, um, the right to seek accountability. That is protective and also um, it is extremely, I mean, it's a prevention um, will come as impunity is ended, uh, and impunity uh, ending um, ending uh, ending impunity requires um, that uh, that there is accountability. Yeah, thank you. We have one question from the audience. So, uh, how can you ensure that they do no harm and that the do no harm and informed consent principles are respected when for 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 search. Yeah, I can see. I can see the question. Sorry. This yeah. is this. I pointed this out that there is often a, there's often a tension uh, between um, between uh, protection and between the other interests. And I, and I think we have to be very careful about this. Do no harm and informed consent in contexts where. Um, where you do not want repeat of the behaviour, um, and the behaviour is repeated uh, in general terms. Many many of the offenders go on to uh, uh, exploit, abuse again. Um, it, it, there, there, and and we and there, there's the interest of uh, essentially we have the interests of others, the interests of the organisation, and um, this is a very difficult case by case discussion. And I could talk about case-by-case um, -case discussions where the protection, um, protection concerns of the victim override, victim survivor, will override um, the other issues. I think it's complicated um, discussing this in uh, discussing sexual exploitation and abuse by our personnel of beneficiaries and sexual harassment, which is directed at uh, other staff in, in the same in in the same basket, really, because the situation of vulnerability of beneficiaries is significantly higher um, than the situation of 
the vulnerability of uh, those who uh, may be uh, at risk of sexual harassment. So this becomes a, a very nuanced discussion. Um, nothing is uh, approached in a, uh, I suppose, um, in a way that could be described as categorical. Uh, much nuance comes into the discussion, uh, and I, th I think that is why uh, having these principles set out uh, is very important so we can, we can discuss how they're implemented in the context of um, the wishes of the victim survivor, uh, and we don't often know what the wishes necessarily are, uh, particularly where you have somebody who's about 12, um, whose family might have very strong views, and um, the interests of uh, making sure that the conduct doesn't recur. We have one more question from Tanya. So thank you so much, Jane. For the CHS Alliance members, we try and see accountability as a whole of, of an organizational process. A cultural mentality. What are your recommendations for for that for what human organization humanitarian organization need to do to bring about this attention to victims' rights? Uh, Tanya, Tanya, thank you for the question, and also thank you for organising that I've spoken today. It's uh, uh, been very. The questions have been very interesting. Um, I think this is exactly uh, why. Um, Certainly, um, why I think it's been so powerful that we've pulled together these principles on a victim-centred, uh, survivor-centred approach to sexual harassment, uh, and I'm, they're, they're available and I can make them available to the Alliance so that everybody at this conference can receive them. Uh, and, and I think this really does, putting something down on paper, then working on the actual content of what is a victim-centred, uh, survivor-centred approach to um, these issues is really important. Um, so, and it, it does change. Having discussions uh, across the whole organisation does change, uh, does change perspectives. Certainly in the case of uh, the UN, uh, UNHCR has been leading, a, a leading discussions with leaders on um, sexual harassment, um, sexual exploitation and abuse. And it is remarkable um, when you participate in these. I mean, I've been steeped in issues relating uh, to violence against women, violence against children, violence against others uh, through all my, since I was about 22. So, and you can see that I'm quite old. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So it comes, you know, it's it's fairly natural to me to immediately think about the rights of the victim survivor. It's not so natural for many. So I think we have to really work hard. Thank you, Jen. Uh, let's take another one briefly. Uh, we have another question coming up. Let's see if I can expand that, yeah. So hi, Jen, enjoying the rights and survivor-based strong approach, is there a way to measure progress over time as a sector in protecting people, especially recognizing that reporting can be a positive sign, meaning people feel safe to report? Oh, certainly, Alex, that's absolutely true. If you have no reports, uh, and I'm going to a big country soon where there are no reports, uh, and a country which has many issues where you would think that there might be, uh, where there is certainly inequality, where there's, uh, where there's uh, imbalance in power, if you have no reports, that is a red flag. That means that uh, your complaint processes are not working well, victim survivors don't feel confident, they don't feel that they will be respected, they think they will be blamed. Um, I don't know. I'm asked how I measure progress over time all the time because uh, whenever I uh, uh, seek funding and so on, I'll have, I have to put in benchmarks, indicators, things of this nature. It's extremely difficult. Uh, I think, um, and this is why in the context of sexual harassment, we're developing a survey, an exit survey for victim survivors. And in the context of my work, uh, we're developing a methodology to seek victim and survivors' feedback, uh, and uh, we hope to pi uh, pilot that early next year. Um, it's complicated because often uh, we will receive very glowing reports, there being an anxiety that if there's criticism, there may be uh, programs or um, some things that are being done uh, to uh, 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 support victims in the realisation of the, their capacity to rebuild their lives might be taken away. 
Uh, but I think hear, hearing from them, listening to them, uh, is the only way we can measure real progress. But certainly we in the UN uh, believe reports are a good thing. Uh, no reports are a red flag. Thank you.